Thank you. Kiara Koto. Uh, hello, everyone. Um, yeah, why are coordinate transformations, why am I even talking if I think coordinate transformations are confusing? <laughs> Which is probably a very good question. Um, that was a very generous introduction. I, I wish I could claim to have been so strong on open source. Um, but we are getting there, I'm getting there. And, uh, and it, one of the wonderful things, I'll just say it now before I actually get into the talk, about the open source thing, which I was just, I was just reminded of again, was at that workshop on, uh, on QGIS yesterday, was the idea, well, how do I get to be doing that? Well, because I wanted to do something and the software didn't do it. And it meant I could do that. I could say, OK, it doesn't do that, but I can make that happen. Isn't that a fantastic thing? That is open source. That's the power of it. I mean, so we end up with something that does what we need rather than something that does what somebody thinks we might need. That's just wonderful. Anyway, totally nothing to do with this, but I just thought I'd get that off my chest. Um, why are coordinate transformations confusing? I don't know if any of you find coordinates transformations confusing. In many ways, um, they're actually really easy. You just go into your coordinate sort of selector and say, I want that one, and it says, there you are. We're transformed to that one. No problem. So that's not particularly confusing. Um, I'm hoping to show you that they actually are quite confusing. <laughs> <laughs> so there we go. That's my mission for today. <laughs> um, so I have to start with coordinates, because you can't have coordinate transformations without coordinates. And this is how coordinates started for me, <laughs> roughly. Um, in maths class, when I was quite young, uh, a long time ago, and we had this idea that you could sort of have these numbers and turn them, put them onto a piece of paper, and it would tell you where that was. And then you could make up shapes and things like that. And to me, that was just like wonderful, and you know, I, can, I, I can turn numbers into, into sort of feasible things. How cool is that? I was a mathematician, so that, I mean, that explains it a bit. Um, I'm not doing that anymore. Well, I am, actually. <laughs> <laughs> so this is just the same thing, but bigger, more points. And it's not a very nice map. I'm not a cartographer. I'm a mathematician, but, and there won't be any really nice maps in this talk, bar one. But um, uh, that, that's kind of basically what I'm saying is, well, that picture with me drawing crosses, that's exactly what we're doing. That's what the, puts the G in phosphor G, the G in GIS, it's coordinates. And what they give us, as you undoubtedly know because you're here, is an implicit relationship between things that otherwise are just disconnected entities. And, and the power we get from that is what makes GIS is such a, a wonderful field to be doing things in and gives us such power of analysis and, and so on. So, coordinates, very simple. X, Y, that gets you where you are, you're on the, on the bottom. So what could possibly go wrong? <laughs> well, if any of you have brought together disparate data sets from different places, then this is the sort of thing that can go wrong. And I don't know how clear it is to see, but here we've got uh, aerial photography from one data source. We've got um, property boundaries from um, the cadastral data set. And clearly, things don't quite match up. There are all sorts of reasons for this. That's just a sort of ex example, if you like. So I thought I'd start off with, well, this is the idea. So what, what could go wrong? I picked um, the parliament building just outside there um, because it looks like a giant survey marker. I hadn't realized it until I looked at it just now and looked at the aerial photograph and I thought, it's a survey marker. It also looks uncannily like a target, which I'm not very happy about. <laughs> um, but anyway, so there we are. I've, I've put a, a sort of my very simple map there, which says I've gone along so far and up so far, and yep, that, that's where uh, the beehive is. So. Why wouldn't it be just right? Why wouldn't, if I measure something else, why isn't it all lining up? Well, the thing that's on that picture there, which isn't outside as far as I can see, are those lines across the ground. Um, it's an inconvenient lack of, of, of lines. Um, what we have is a bit more like that, where we have to do some process of measurement to work out where we are. And every measurement, as we all know, 
has an error associated with it. So we don't really quite know where those lines are. They're sort of um, vague. <laughs> um, but then there's another thing. There's actually more than one way of measuring and more than one reference system that, that we could use to work out where that point is. One very simple way, the traditional way, is we go and find another survey mark and we measure to it and we say we're that far from that survey mark. So whatever reference frame that survey mark was in terms of, we're now in terms of. Um, that's straightforward. These days we have another very, very good one, uh, which is we use GPS. We can do it with the phone these days, for heaven's sake. Um, so, so you could be measuring that. Now in that case we're working on a global coordinate system. Basically the GPS measures relative to the orbit of the satellites, which is about the centre of mass of the Earth. So we're measuring our position relative to something down there. A very hard to find point, but very, very accurately located by, by GPS. Um, and there's one more thing that makes it tricky. Oh, I hope this works. There we go. Oops, keep going, keep going. Oops, back, back, back. I'm going to go back to that because I put a lot of work into this. <laughs> okay. I think it's this one. There we go. There. Um, oh, that's pathetic. It's supposed to show this one coming down like that, the one grid moving relative to another, and meanwhile the beehive chugging off up there. Basically things are moving. That was the picture that really conveyed that to you so well. <laughs> um, everything is moving. Um, this is uh, a picture of the uh, reference stations for the, um, for the global reference, ITRF reference syst uh, system, reference frame, and um, they're basically stations that record or measure their position using GPS and they do it every 30 seconds or continuously and, and you can track them and basically that tells you where they're moving relative to the globe as a whole. Um, as you can see, Australia is the winner here. Australia is the fastest moving <laughs> place on Earth. Um, they're good on them. <laughs> <laughs> but nonetheless, they're not as badly off as New Zealand because Australia is moving together. New Zealand isn't. Um, but anyway, moving things, that's nothing new. There's lots of things move. You know, trucks move, boats move, migrating birds move, and we can track those things. And we, one of the ways we track them is with our GPS satellites. Excuse my slightly childish illustrations here. Um, so they, basically we can, we can put a, a tracker on them, we can say where are you going, and we know we can say at any time where is this point. The thing we don't do generally is track our house, or track a tree, or track pylons because we think they are fixed. So our in intuition, our idea about what's moving doesn't quite relate with what's, the re what's happening in the real world on a global scale. Um, we do track ourselves generally. We've, most of us are tracking ourselves with our phone these days. So, who's measuring how all these things are moving? Well, the answer in this case is, is in New Zealand. It's Land Information New Zealand, which we do with help from our friends. Um, and our main friend who's helping with this is GNS Science, who've been measured, me, me, measured? mentioned already <laughs> um, by Brent and others. Um, so they, they basically run a, a network of receivers for us. So this is sort of the scaled down global uh, receiver network. This is the, what we call the positions network. It's a set of, of uh, GPS receivers that are running continuously and tracking their position. And so we have well behaved ones like uh, th this is Auckland, which is nicely away from the plate boundary. Plate boundary runs down, excuse me, through here. Um, just go back to my podium. Um, and so Auckland's well away from it, so basically it's moving fairly consistently. This one is down at, at a Pusigid point down there, um, and this one includes an earthquake that happened in uh, 2009, um, the Dusky Sound earthquake. So that started off going nicely, but then an earthquake happened, shoot it off, shot off sideways, and then there's a sort of recovery time after that. So, so we're tracking it all. We can, from that, those measurements and from other, basically, uh, cam what we call campaign measurements, which is just going out and doing surveys and then repeating them another year or so later, we get a picture of the overall movement of New Zealand. And we, this is a, the deformation model that we, we generate from that. Deformation model just says, this is how things are deforming. It's a, it's a, 
in this case, a grid model that says, if you are here, this is how fast you're, you're moving. So we haven't quite got the whole picture there, but this is our starting point to handling that movement. And, and what we're particularly trying to handle here is the difference between the global reference system, where you are with respect to the center of the mass of the Earth, and the local system, which is, says, this is where you are on, on this bit of land. So how do we say, measure what's happened there so we can say what's happened to that bit of land? The deformation model is the answer as best we can do it. Oops. And what that gives us, and this is another fancy one that isn't going to work. Um, I'll move straight on past that. Oh, it did. I did. <laughs> How inconvenient. <laughs> the idea that you probably saw there, but I whisked past it so quickly, was that now we have one coordinate system which is moving with the beehive. So our NZGD2000 coordinate system effectively is a coordinate system that moves with the land uh, and it means that the coordinates within that system don't change. We still need to, if we want to convert that to and from uh, another date, and we do need to use the deformation model to say, well, what time are we interested in this location? At that time, this is where it is in a global system. It does have one unfortunate consequence, and this, this picture here comes also from GNS. It was made before G, GD2000, this was in the late 1990s, they made this wonderful picture. But if you imagine that th those green lines there are the New Zealand graph paper for NZGD2000. Wonder, oh, no, that won't work. There we go again, another interesting exercise. This is a video. I thought that was probably pushing my luck a bit. Oh, look. Ugh. Ugh. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's over four million years. Uh, we're not thinking we'll still be using NZGD2000 in four million years. <laughs> <laughs> but it does give the idea that what, there is a, a downside to tracking this, which is that our, our coordinate system is getting bent. Um, but wait, there's more. <laughs> so that, that was a picture that just said, OK, this is the velocities. This is how fast things are moving on average for any particular point in the country. And that's a really good start. But we also have to deal with earthquakes. Um, and this is a relatively benign earthquake. This is the Darfield earthquake. Um, if I remember correctly, uh, which um, was the precursor to the Christchurch earthquakes, which were far less benign. Um, so what do we do with those? Oh, put up a menu. Ah, cool. Um, so we, would, we need to get that movement also into our deformation model so that we can say, well, if you're in this area and it's after the earthquake, where are you now? And so we, to do that, we, we again, it's, it's a process of surveying. We do all these surveys. We measure where things have moved to. Um, our colleagues at GNS Science then take all that data, generate a model of the earthquake. This, this shows all the faults. It's, it's a, if you can imagine this was a 3D picture, it would show all the faults that, that, that are modeled as, as rupturing during that event and how much movement there was. In, and from that, we can say, OK, all that happened, therefore, this is the movement on the surface. It's a, a mathematical simplification of, of, of the movement. And that gives us another set of grids that say this is, this is the movement at this point here, it's this x, this y, um, as a result of that earthquake. And so we end up with what we've strangely called a patch, which is so, uh, essentially it's a, a perturbation on the, on, the, on the velocity model It says, if you're after the earthquake, um, you've got this much extra movement to account for. That's a slight simplification on how we actually do it, but I'm not going to get into. We have things called forward and reverse patches, and that's for another time. The main problem with that, for our, from our point of view, and it's, it's one we haven't, we're still working on, is the fact that there's an inconvenient amount of time between the earthquake happening and us having made the measurements, built the model, and calculated what, what, um, what, the, grid, what the deformation is and, and put that into our deformation model. There is a really cool technology which I, I just find so cool. So I had to show the pictures because they're pretty as well. Um, and that's a, a thing called differential interfer interferometric synthetic aperture radar, which is, I think I've got that right, it's DINSAR anyway. Um, 
And that's basically a, a radar measurements which measure, the, if you like, the, the terrain, but then you take the difference between two of those and you can measure the movement of the terrain. It's limited in as much as it's only the movement to or from the satellite, but it's a really good start to measuring deformation. And you basically you can do that as soon as you've got those images. Um, so pretty much you know, a few days after the earthquake, you can get a picture like this. And somewhere there it says the, the scale of those. Between, so basically each of those bands of, or cycles of, of, through the spectrum is five centimeters movement. This is the Kaikoura earthquake, um, much bigger thing. Um, I mean, like, how amazing is that, that you've got a technology that can say the ground moved within a few centimetres this much, and you can do that, like, on a, on a by basically remote sensing way across the entire area affected at that density of points. So it's just incredible. I mean, like, when I, when I was at university, I was measuring, you know, earthquakes and things, and, and it was a very, very slow process. <laughs> this is... Sorry, I, I get excited by it. <laughs> anyway, so that's coming. What we end up with then is, is, a, is a datum which says, which includes a deformation model. So we have um, coordinate, how am I doing for time, by the way, am I? Oh, good. Um, I do rattle on. Um, <laughs> so we have um, a deformation that says, We've got this velocity, but then if you're after this earthquake, we've got that much movement. If you're after that one, we've got that as well, and so on. And we've now, each of those effectively is a new version of the deformation model. Um, and as you can see, this is a list of the versions we've had so far. We managed to keep going. We started in 2000 when we created the datum. We managed to last to 2013 before we said we really have to put in some of this the, these events. Up till then, there have been a number of big events, but they've been kind of down the bottom of the South Island, where, apologies to anyone, um, where basically the, uh, although there was quite a lot of movement, it, it, the effect was largely in areas where there was not a lot of population um, and didn't really impact on, on, on the, uh, the use of the data. That changed with the Christchurch earthquake, um, where for many reasons we needed to get, get things um, tidied up. So, so at that point, we also up, updated for all the other earthquakes. We then had releases for, for subsequent earthquakes. So now we're, we're actually starting to get to a process where we can actually maintain this fairly, um, fairly quickly, which is great. So now we know how to get how to do a coordinate transformation, which is what this topic was supposed to be about, um, <laughs> between where things are in New Zealand and where they are in the globe, and that's what you need to bring data sets together that have come from these multiple sources. Um, if you can get everything back to a global reference system or, or to a local reference, if you can make that transformation, you can basically sort out a lot of your differences. You can't sort out differences due to measurement errors or whatever, but you can at least get rid of the systematic errors from um, basically from, from things moving. So that's great. We've got a model that can do it. What do you do? Like, how do you use that? Um, so the, our first thing we did was back in 2013 was we, we published it. We said, well, look, here it is. I know you can't use it, but you can have it. <laughs> um, and we published it in a, a simpler format as we could come up with, which was basically a zip file containing a whole lot of CSV files, which were grids of you know, latitude, longitude, x, dx, dy, that's it, or dx, dy, dz, dx, east, north, up, actually. So, so you've got all these grids there, you've got something that tells you, like a, another meta, metadata or CSV file that says, if you're between these dates, you use this grid, and so on. Works perfectly, but you haven't got any software to use it. We did provide some other stuff, we put in, um, so, uh, a Python code that can at least you can use to calculate or do calculate what the value of the deformation is at any given time and place, and we put in some documentation even. For, I mean, but you know it's still not exactly something you can casually pick up and use unless you you're, you're a developer and, and keen to, to do it. Um, so that's been maintained as we've added new uh, 
as, as earthquakes have happened and we've, we've enhanced the, the deformation model or in, included them in it. So we're now up at 124 grids with 16 files of metadata telling you what to do. Still the Python code, pretty much the same. And, and still the, def the documentation. So that's a, that's a bunch of stuff there um, which you can take and, and use, but, but it doesn't really slot into any system. <sighs> what more can you do? Well, I, had I been on the ball, I could have done a lot more, I think. But what I really love is the fact that there is some good news. And it's all really quite recent. This is like you know hot off the press stuff. Um, and the good news is that, and this is where, where I basically take my hat off to anyone who's involved in standards and, and open uh, and, and kind of setting these frameworks in place because that underlies everything we do. Um, so the OGC standards around uh, referencing by coordinates um, and the uh, well-known text representation of coordinate reference uh, systems, the latest releases of those, as you can see, 8th of February 2019, 13th of August 2019, have a lot of stuff around how coordinate transformations are handled. And that, in turn, reflects into our, for the open source community, pretty much universal underlying coordinate transformation engine, PROJ, PROJ6 now, um, which is, has taken, take, had some huge changes to the way that it, it basically works out how you transform this system to this. The crucial thing there is that the way it used to work is you said, here is a coordinate system, here's another one. We'll convert this one to WS84 and then convert from WS84 to that. That conversion was generally not well defined. Uh, also, there is no way of saying anything very complicated about it. Um, what you have now is, is something that says you can specify relationships between coordinate systems. They can include multiple steps of transformation. They can have different extents and then Basically, a projection projection is really the wrong word for this. That's conversions. But we're actually talking um, transformations. It, but it still has this name, proj. Um, but what it actually is is a transformation engine. And it can now say, OK, we're converting this data set from, let's say, ITF 2008, which is a global reference frame, to NZGD 2000. The data set was observed at, let's say, you know, 2014. Um, and it's in this place. So what's, firstly, which set of transformations is the one that do, does that? So you go through your transformation. It says, OK, this one applies for that times, that time, read, you know, let's say, between 2011 and 2016. So that's the one to use. And then we put that all together. And that all happens without us having to sort of uh, manually select which transformation to do. So, so it's put a lot of capability in there to define realistic, world real transformations. Really exciting stuff. OK, cool. Right, this is the end. Don't worry. <laughs> you, thank you so much for hanging in so far. Um, so, that, so basically, this is my, my good news story. This is the thing that, that I, and, and I, I must admit I've been behind the game in this. But when I started looking at this, I thought, wow, this is actually even better than I thought. It's really cool stuff. So huge thanks to all those who are involved in I mean, and it's you know from within this community, and in terms of standards, and in terms of implementation of this infrastructural software, which makes basically makes our world work. Um, fantastic. Um, so, how could coordinate transformations be confusing? Well, I hope by now you got an idea, at least some of the factors that come into play around deformation, which is one of the the least probably considered aspects of of error in spatial data. Um, and the crucial thing there is metadata, of course, and in particular metadata that says when something was captured, when you captured it, what it was referenced to, because it may be you captured it in 2008, but you referenced it to coordinates that were captured in 2003. Well, which one is actually applying? Um, and then once you've done that, you also need to know, since that data was captured, what transformations have been done to it already? Because quite often data is transformed in many ways before you actually get to see it. So you need to know. So that's a, another sort of metadata that we want to be capturing. So the take home from that is make sure you get this information. Make sure you keep it with the data. 
Um, and finally, you need software that can do the transformations you actually need to do, and you need the parameters to do that. And that's the area that's coming on really fast now. It's sort of, in 2000, when we created our, what we called at that time, a semi-dynamic datum, that was what we didn't have. Um, and here, but now in, in 2019, it's becoming a problem for everyone in the world. Everywhere is moving, and it's starting to, and, and our accuracies are becoming so much greater that um, it's becoming a, a global problem, and, and so we're having global solutions. Fantastic. Thank you so much for your attention. I realize I've pushed my time limits here. I couldn't help myself. <laughs> Thank you very much, Chris. <laughs> You're welcome. And, uh